These are 10 orchestral works that you need to study to become a better composer and orchestrator. Number one, Mozart's Symphony No. 40 in G minor. The 40th Symphony is a great place to begin when you start to study the layers of orchestration. Foreground, middle ground, and background are always very clear. And there's rarely a moment that even when he's using the whole orchestra, Mozart has more than three things happening at one time. There's also an exploration of orchestral color that was pretty new for the era, with interplay between different sections like winds versus strings, for example. And with only 10 staves, it's fairly manageable for a beginner to follow along with, compared to some of the much bigger orchestras we'll see in the works near the end of this list. By the way, to make sure you can actually access them all for free, I'm limiting this list to only include things that are available on IMSLP. So we're only gonna focus on classical repertoire here, no film or video game music this time. And of course, there is so much music that I have to leave out, so consider these 10 a starter pack before you dive deeper into any specific composer or era. Number two, Beethoven's Symphony No. 3 in E-flat major. Not just in orchestration, but in all areas, Beethoven is known for taking what Mozart and Haydn achieved and pushing it to a new extreme. In the third symphony, we take what we learned from Mozart and learn how to make it bigger and more expressive. We saw before an interplay between winds and brass. Here, Beethoven starts to push that idea further by comparing not just different sections, but of actual individual instrumental colors. Also, check out the way he creates orchestral textures. Like here, we have a melody in violin and oboe, accompaniment in the lower strings, a pedal tone in the horns, and this arpeggio in the clarinet. The result is a very rich and full sound. Many of Mozart's orchestral works could be reduced to smaller ensembles without having to lose much of the musical context. But now we're reaching a point where the orchestration is becoming more complex and intricate. By the way, these are all going to be presented in chronological order, not by any kind of ranking. Number three, Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. Beethoven is usually considered the last classical and kind of first romantic composer, but Berlioz is firmly in the romantic period. Not only does his symphony have a story that he's telling with the music, but it overflows with passion. The first movement is literally called Dreams and Passions. As composers, I think the most important thing for us to get from this piece, besides learning how romantic composers started to push the boundaries of classical composition, is the idea of the leitmotif. A leitmotif is a short musical idea or fragment that becomes associated with a specific character or idea. If you've ever seen Star Wars and you heard Luke Skywalker's theme or the Force theme, you've heard a leitmotif. Berlioz called it a fixed idea, but the concept is the same. He's not the first composer to do this, and Wagner would become way more famous for doing it in his operas, but he really leans into it. Berlioz uses his fixed idea in all five movements of the symphony, with different presentations and variations, but always in a recognizable way. If you're a film or video game composer, this idea of using a recurring motive or theme is probably just second nature. And it can be hard for us to appreciate that this is something early composers actually had to come up with. And as a bonus, if you've ever seen The Shining, Stanley Kubrick used an excerpt from the fifth movement of this symphony in the very opening of the film, when the family is driving up the mountain to the hotel. Number four, Brahms' Symphony Number no. 4 in E minor. In a lot of ways, Brahms did to Beethoven what Beethoven did to Mozart and Haydn, which was to push their achievements to new limits. He's also firmly in the Romantic era, and although sometimes critics call him academic, he's incredibly expressive. For example, look at this gesture in the first movement. This could be right out of a modern film score. And you can hear that he's using the orchestra to express ideas and feelings, not just main themes and transitions and so on. Here's another passage that is very intricate and complex, but the main melody line still clearly cuts through. Mm -hmm. 
Number five, Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade. This is probably my favorite piece from the whole list. When I made my series on the eight orchestral textures of George Frederick McKay, I used a lot of examples from Scheherazade because Rimsky-Korsakov uses a pretty wide range of orchestral textures. And in this piece, you can get a pretty good variety of ways to arrange for the orchestra. He also places a stronger emphasis on contrast of color and timbre than we've seen yet. For example, listen to this part where he goes from an unaccompanied solo violin to a bassoon with low strings in support. You can study how he reuses and arranges the same melodic ideas across different orchestral colors and what he does differently to support those different colors. For example, that melody we just heard in the bassoon hands off to the oboe. Then the violins. and then the woodwinds as an entire section. Also, Rimsky-Korsakov was a teacher and mentor to Igor Stravinsky. And if you listen to Stravinsky's early works and you're familiar with Scheherazade, the influence is pretty clear. Number six, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite. The Nutcracker showcases two things that Tchaikovsky was especially good at, which are melodies and orchestration. It's also a really good model for those of us who write shorter works like video game tracks, because some of the pieces are just a minute or two long. So there are some nice examples of how to structure a shorter piece. But the main thing for us to focus on is the orchestration, which has incredible clarity. I heard a great line recently recently from Steve Duda, who's the creator of the Serum Synthesizer. Clarity is, it's what you don't hear more than what you hear that makes something clear. When you look at the score for the Nutcracker, it really feels like there's not a note there that doesn't need to be there. The different lines and parts all come together so clearly because there's a lot of space around them. And also because Tchaikovsky is very diligent about keeping the different orchestral sections on separate ideas. For example, in this moment in the march, the main idea is in a chordal texture in the brass and woodwinds. But because it's very staccato and there are literal rests between the notes, we have plenty of room to hear this rising 16th note gesture in the strings. And then when the high winds play this little fill at the end of the phrase, they are the only moving part. The strings have rested and the brass are holding out a sustained chord. So even when there's plenty of activity going on, we can hear it all very clearly. Number seven, Debussy's Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. Up to this point, nobody has pushed the idea of orchestral color as much as Debussy. He's called an impressionist because it's like he paints with the orchestra, creating moods and atmospheres more than just melodies and chords. We've seen suggestions of this already, like that gesture from Brahms or the color contrast from Rimsky-Korsakov, but Debussy took it to a whole new level. Debussy pushes the limits in a lot of ways. For example, he uses unusual scales and modes, and he orchestrates with such rhythmic precision that his written parts feel improvised. This flute part is just one example of a line that is so embellished, it feels free. And here we have gestures functioning as accompaniment parts, like these rumbling tremolos in the horns and the plucked accents in the strings. One of the reasons this list is in chronological order is because you really need to have a firm grasp of what Mozart was doing before you can wrap your head around what Debussy was doing. Number eight, Ravel's Mother Goose Suite. The Mother Goose Suite is a beautiful piece of music, but it has a very unique feature that really helps us composers and orchestrators. The piece was originally written for piano four hands, and it wasn't until a year later that he decided to orchestrate it. So we essentially have the piano sketch that we can compare directly to the orchestration. It can be very interesting to look at how he made different color choices, where he decided to add parts to fill in the orchestra, and we can make these comparisons in ways that we can't with the Debussy, for example. What I think is the most important lesson to get from comparing them though, is that it really helps you separate the music or the composition from the orchestration. <laughs> 
you play or listen to the piano part, you realize that it's all there. The melodies, the chords, the counter lines, it's all written in the music. The orchestral version is expressing that same music, just with different colors. It's kind of like when Dorothy and Toto step into Oz for the first time and everything goes from black and white to technicolor. Dorothy and Toto are still the same characters, now we're just seeing them in a different way. I have a lot of students who struggle with orchestral music because they confuse composition and orchestration as the same thing. So studying this piece from Ravel can really help you separate the processes and appreciate the difference between your musical ideas and the colors you're using to express them. Number nine, Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Legend has it that this piece caused such an outrage when it premiered that the theater broke out into a riot. There's some debate about how exaggerated that story really is, but it's kind of believable because Stravinsky did things in the Rite of Spring that were probably the ugliest, most grotesque things anyone had ever heard from an orchestra at that point. Debussy was evoking new and interesting sounds from the orchestra, but the result was always beautiful. In the case of Stravinsky, the result is intentionally grotesque and shocking. So what can you learn by studying it? Well, a lot of things. In the 2020s, ostinato patterns are pretty run-of-the-mill standard accompaniment patterns. But 100 years ago, this really wasn't as much the case. There are some brilliant examples of incessant ostinatos, and what Stravinsky does to keep the other parts moving and interesting deserves attention. You also find some of the best examples of what McKay calls the polyrhythmic texture, where no single line is the sole focus, but we end up with this fabric of sound, different lines and gestures that form a sum greater than their individual parts. Number 10, Gustav Holst's The Planets. I think in a lot of ways we could consider The Planets to be the godfather of film scoring. If you're a film composer, there's probably no way you aren't already familiar with this work. It's been very clearly used as temp music in Star Wars and Gladiator, and I'm sure it's still being used today. The orchestra is massive. He's got six French horns, four trumpets, four trombones, two harps. He's even got a bass oboe, and he puts all of that muscle to use. Just listen to how huge this is. but he also has his moments of serenity. Despite the massive size of the orchestra, if you actually study the score and focus on how many different layers there are, we come back to the same principles that we've been seeing since the Mozart 128 years earlier. Orchestration is not about coming up with 42 different individual parts to be played all at once, but about using your available instruments to express your music. Listen to this section, which uses almost the entire orchestra for a huge sound, and notice how few different ideas there really are playing at any one time. If you want to actually learn something when you analyze these scores and not just let the pretty music fly by, check out this video where I talk about how to analyze music and I walk you through a Notion template to turn what you hear into things you can actually use. If you've been getting value from these videos and you're looking for a way to support the channel, I'll put a link in the description to my Patreon page. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.